Hello, and welcome to Teachers Talk Radio. It is the Friday lunch show with Todd Brennan and Morgan Whitfield, and we are in our new time slot, so thanks for joining us. Today is Friday, August 30th, and we will be discussing the insanity that is starting a new job at a new school. Quite personal as Todd and I are doing that right now and having some pretty amazing experiences. This is uh, Teachers Talk joining, Radio, and, and you stories, are listening so live. Tune in live at ttradio.org or to join in the conversation, download the Podbean app and search Teachers Talk Radio. Follow the hashtag TT Radio. Tune in, talk it out with Teachers Talk Radio. This is Teachers Talk Radio. Hello, and you how are, are you listening. Doing? Hi, how are you? Good. Good. Live. Oh, just turning off the music. It's okay. That's a bit of drama, my, I think. I, it really does. The trigger button on my music key <clears> is, is a little dramatic. But yeah, um, it is so lovely to hear your voice. Um, it has been a while because we've been on summer break and now we're back in a new time slot. And we've been messaging a little bit, but with both of us starting new jobs and new schools, it has been kind of overwhelming, but in the most wonderful way. How are you doing? I'm good. Yeah, I, I'm listening to you talk there and I'm thinking about the title that you've gone for for the show. I calculated just a few minutes before we started that in reading your book, the sort of the the proofs of your book. I think I'd read about 30,000 words of yours um, and I'm going to disagree with one of them or at least ask you to elaborate on it with this word insanity because I've had a lovely induction <laughs> to my school and I think you have too. I've had the best induction. Um, I think that when we think about starting at a new school, it all seems like so much because it's a completely new ecosystem. And I have to say, I... I think my school is absolutely outstanding. It's a new adventure. I ha have been enjoying absolutely every minute. So I don't want the title to imply that it's been insanity in a crazy way yeah. um, uh, that it feels kind of out of control. It's just that it's a brand new mountain um, and you start at the very bottom of it and you're looking up at the peak and you know that this is going to be a great mountain to climb, but... Um, <laughs> When you're at the very, very bottom, you're just kind of wondering, well, how am I going to get there? Um, but the journey is fantastic. So forgive the metaphor. But okay. yeah, I, I am really, really excited to talk about my experience the past few weeks because it has been overwhelmingly positive. Yeah, um, we, we yeah. pretty much ended with Kat talking to us through talking us through her advice about starting a new school and I was kind of interested today to pick up on a few things that came out of that conversation <laughs> to see if we'd taken our own advice or Kat's advice <laughs> um, and to talk of a little bit I definitely want to come around to this idea of the J curve um, which I can't remember if Kat or I talked about in the in that podcast but um, in that episode but essentially that thing that you know is going to happen you know you're not going to be the slickest 100% version of yourself and yet <laughs> it still hits you um so it's definitely an amazing experience starting a new school particularly when you are really excited about the project and the school overall but um yeah that that j curve is is very real i'm feeling that at the moment I think it's really fascinating um, because you can prepare a lot for a new school. We did an entire show about how to prepare for a new job, a new role, what you can do to prepare just as a teacher coming in to your classroom and you want to get ready. Um, but at the same time, all of that preparation, um, mentally building myself up, doing all the reading, I feel like I did all my homework, uh, but that doesn't necessarily mean that the test that you take in the real world um, is in any way comparable to what you expect it to be. Um, and, and I think it's a good thing because I was so surprised by many things that I've encountered along the way. 
um, and the systems and processes uh, that I thought would be daunting have actually made my life so much easier. Mm-hmm. So why don't we kind of go through, I guess, kind of the chronological steps of arriving at a new school. And I guess more anecdotally, just tell our stories because it has been a, a, a few weeks and I'm actually incredibly curious as to what your experience was like and how it kind of um, contrasts with mine. So uh, yeah, can you tell me what was it like when you arrived those first few days and what it was like meeting a whole bunch of other new staff like yourself? So I kind of feel like obviously some listeners will be in the UK or be in a country where they're they're settled. And there is something very different about doing this internationally. I think that's the first thing to say. Um, So even though I'd been in the UAE and the same city for six years, changing schools still came and comes with an awful lot of of extras um, that you have to kind of factor in. and, And watching leadership manage that um, so brilliantly is actually, yeah, it, it's kind of impressive and you, you really have to consider that um, both as an individual and as a leader for people coming into country, um, but even moving within country. So I'd been at the same school for six years. Um, I really loved it. It was a fantastic school and we'd built something that was just amazing. And I'm looking back on it now with just absolute pride. I, I actually can't believe now that that we built the thing we built. But it was just time. It was time to shift to a new thing, a new opportunity. And I had two in mind and one came up. Um, So I've gone in with this real excitement and I guess that fits with the old J curve. Um, As much as you come in and you, you know, it's just this amazing thing. I'm reminded of that social network quote where Justin Timberlake's character, who I should really know, um, says you don't know what it is yet. Right now it's just cool. (laughs) And I'm still in that kind of amazing honeymoon phase. Um, And I'm probably about to to reach that frustration of not quite being able to do what I want to. Like not being as slick as I was in the last place after six years of being there and not being quite as smooth. So I've started at a new school. I I think it's really phenomenal. I mean, everybody who visits it says it's outstanding. Um, the results are phenomenal. Um, you can hardly believe that they're, they're um, true, but they are. And I'm I'm just kind of trying to feel my way into it and get used to, as you said, get used to the systems and processes um, because they are the thing that make everything that little bit smoother. Um, but when you do this internationally, there's so much more to it. There's There's obviously... Uh, there's family things if you've got a family or if, if you don't, there's there's kind of making new friends and getting used to a new city or a new place or, you know, even something silly like I was speaking to a colleague, uh, a former colleague a few weeks ago who's moved across schools in Dubai and she's she was saying to me, I don't have the same supermarkets over this side of the city. It sounds silly, but all those little details that sort of stack up and, and add to it. I can't remember what you asked, Morgan, but that's kind of been me over the last month, all of that and so much more. I think that's so funny because as someone who has just moved country uh, for my new job, um, all of that resonates. Um, (laughs) And I think the school has gone out of its way to welcome me in every single way possible. And they began quite early. So I was moving country after being 12 years in one place. I've now moved to Vietnam. And what's been fascinating is the onboarding process for actually moving country in terms of the bureaucracy um, can be can be quite daunting. Um, And so having a crack HR team at the other end who is incredibly responsive and proactive and can streamline things for you, can ensure that at every single bump they are making it as easy as possible, that makes a huge difference. So I think that is unique to international schools or moving internationally, but I think any time that you change jobs, that's almost your very first impression of the school is how they onboard you in a very practical way, how they do their safeguarding checks. Um, Things like that uh, can be quite important because they are the very first impression that staff get. Um, Almost immediately after I was hired, I was set up with a teacher uh, partner, so a buddy who could take me through, I could ask questions, and this was somebody that was outside of my department, Um, and they try to actually pair people up who have 
the same living situation. So if you are moving to a new city or a new place, it's really nice to be have a buddy who also has kids around your age. So they can tell mm -hmm. you about where to take your family in the city um, and help you direct be directed to the things that you think are going to be particularly pertinent to your family situation. Yeah, um, part of my induction think, was, sorry to interrupt you, part of no, my induction was they, they, something that they covered was which supermarkets stock, stock British biscuits? <laughs> and as silly <laughs> as it sounds, you know, I'm sure you had a similar experience, but Australian colleagues once find, I think they're called tam, Tim Tams. And, you know, those little things that like when you're having yes. a bit of a, a rubbish day and you're like, oh, I want those biscuits that I like from home because I'm missing home. Although it seems like such as you know a silly thing to cover in induction, all of that as well as having a oh my kids now got a friend, it all does make such a big difference. You're right. Sorry to have interrupted, but it just it reminded me yeah. of that biscuit. <laughs> they literally went through um, which which supermarkets could give you that feeling of of home. That's so funny you mentioned that because that's exactly the next thing that I we were onboarded with is we were given a new staff website. So it was an entire website that was completely devoted to all the questions about the city and that new staff would need to know. So there was a section on, well, with our healthcare plan, the dentists that they recommend that are attached and covered by insurance, where you go for doctor's visits. Um, it covered things like the supermarkets that you would most likely find the things that you would need, um, where you would go to pick up furniture. So like the directions to the equivalent of Ikea, um, bus routes, transportation, how to use taxi cards. Um, so all the practical things, what you should visit in the city, but in enough detail that um, you felt like you had so much direction before you arrived. Uh, on top of that, we had access to kind of an, a version of our staff handbook. So it didn't have that we were all given um, a login for new staff so that we wouldn't see any of the school's kind of proprietary uh, details or um, student data, obviously. But it gave us a view of what the policies of the school were what the procedures were, um, what the, the teaching and learning um, atmosphere was like. And it was really, really powerful because you felt like you had all of this information at your fingertips um, about your work and your life um, right there ahead of you. So it takes a lot of those questions that you may feel are quite silly to ask and it makes it really easy for you to digest because it was just a Google website um, that was that was super lovely to navigate. Uh, so having that before we even stepped in country um, was incredibly useful. So I think that's one thing that's very unique to international schools, I think. But it did give, I think, in any case, any school can do something like that to make new staff feel like they get a taste of the school before they even walk through the doors. Yeah, definitely. And and it, obviously with it being international, there's a lot more thought goes into sort of small details from memory. This is thinking about moving schools in the UK. Um, but, I'm, I, you know, the inductions that I had in the UK were, were very thorough, but they were much more about those policies and the procedures, not necessarily about, you know, OK, that if, if you forget your, your lunch, there's actually a Tesco's around the corner or whatever, which which does matter. But And you pick up from other staff. Um and I suppose maybe for those that haven't got the international experience, it does sound a, a little condescending possibly or a little um, a little bit like you're being babied. But actually, there's so much to think about when you make that move that um, that it is necessary. So I suppose my reflection on it is, is if I was thinking about inductions that I've had in the UK, what would I add into them and, and what were they like? And I'm trying to remember and um, we did do things like we had a sort of a family lunch with existing teachers and, and stuff like that and that, that that sort of thing is is very nice and very kind of comforting that you you immediately get that chance to to um you know spark up some friendships and some conversations with people particularly outside of your department as you said yeah um, i think that there's kind of formal and informal opportunities to bring staff um into a school and they're both equally important because what you really want is you want to retain staff as well. So that that first experience um, and kind of bonding them to their colleagues, uh, it's really important. Yeah, definitely. And I think, you know, for some for some staff that can be the I'm thinking about staff um, teachers who, you know, maybe haven't 
um, see now, obviously in the UAE, it's a two-year con- contract and quite a lot of people um, historically haven't even made it past uh, January in certain schools. Um, you know, they come in the August and, and they take the December and think, well, I'll just, that that's me, I can't do this. And when I, the, the common factor that I see with those people is just that sense of being centred um, within their location and within some sort of social group. You know, it, it, it's all fairly obvious if you think about it, but it, it wouldn't be, it wouldn't be in everyone's sort of playbook, I don't think, in, a, in an ordinary induction. Um, I think um, it, it's really interesting. I think I've had a, I've had really great induction experiences before, um, but the one that I've just had, I think, is really re- unique because it has been an extended induction. So for staff coming in, what they have done is they've said, well, staff don't have any extracurricular or co-curricular activities that they do for the first term. Instead, we are doing sessions every week or every other week during the term to kind of bring you into the culture of the school. And that has been fantastic. Instead of induction being an information dump of this is how you sign on and use the projectors in the school. Um, this is how your laptop works. This is how um, you this is how you have to control kids when you're going out for a fire drill, where it tends to be information overload. Um, one of my friends used the word um, acculturation, and I feel that is what an induction is truly meant to do. It's meant to bring you into the ethos of the school. And that to me is the heart of what this induction that I've just experienced is. Um, it's, it's about actually changing culture as well, because when you bring new staff in, you actually have a chance to set standards that are extremely high. This is the way we do things here, and this is the norm that we're setting. So it sets a really fantastic tone, and it also kind of can also bring up the norms of a school because those staff coming in, this is all that they've ever known. Um, so you really have an opportunity to step up your game when you are bringing in staff for the new time, uh, for the first time. And the culture of the school can really be enhanced because you're also forced to define it along the way. Yeah, definitely. I've been thinking about that. Just the fact that, you know, those what appear to be stupid questions can actually be quite powerful for the people inside the building. And I'm, you know, not suggesting that I've had some sort of impact already, but just in asking a few simple questions, um, I've noticed people are are, are explaining themselves and and clarifying their thinking around it. Um, So it's actually an opportunity to both ways. I'm not sure if you've read um, I forget which book it is, but it's about Clive Woodward's England team. Uh, the name of it will come back to me in a little while. But he used to get all the new starters to share a drill from their previous, uh, from their clubs as they joined the international team, whether they were 17 or, or 34. If they were making their first cap, they, they shared their first, um, they shared a drill or, or a key thing, a key ingredient. You know, of course, it could be dismissed, but equally it might be something really powerful um, that the team could then use. And um, yeah, I, I certainly wouldn't claim to have made any significant impact at this stage, but it's been, it's been really pleasant to be, to be um, listened to even when I, I kind of feel that the question might be a little silly. Um, and, and I do think I've noticed that the, the people are being very clear or they're clarifying something that maybe, how would you say it's been in the institutional memory so long that they almost can't imagine not doing it. Does that make sense? It does make sense. And I think there is, we say it as teachers all the time, there's no such thing as the stupid question, which is good because I feel like in the past three or four weeks, I have asked about 400,000 questions. Um, (laughs) And some of them have been about really simple things um, that I just am adjusting to. And the fact that I feel comfortable enough to ask those questions, I think says a lot and that people have been so open and generous to take the time to explain things to me or to show me how to do something, uh, but also to also reflect when I ask a question and say, oh, why do we do that? Or, oh, is there another way to do that? Should we change? 
um, which I think it, it takes a lot to be like, oh, well, that makes me think about it in a new way. Um, because it is, it is something about you've hired someone for their expertise, so they're sharing their experience as well. So um, when you have those things like induction and new staff coming in, it's about making sure that you get the very best of them. Uh, so yeah, there, there's a lot there to unpack. I thought we'd just kind of listen to some words from our sponsors and then we can go a little bit more into induction and perhaps school priorities. Does that sound good? Yeah, great. Okay, Sorry, I accidentally muted myself. <laughs> this show is brought to you in partnership with John Cat Educational, publishers of professional development books and resources that support great teaching and learning in schools around the world. Don't miss out. Level up your professional development today and visit johncatbookshop.com to explore the full range of titles. Use the code JCTTR2425 for 20% off your order. Happy reading. Get set for the year ahead with the Bloomsbury Education Back to School Sale. Save 30% on all Bloomsbury Education books until 30th September. From the very best in research-led practice to trusted advice on inclusivity, behavior, and curriculum design, we've got something for everyone. Visit bloomsbury.com forward slash B2S sale to shop now and save 30%. Bloomsbury Education, books for every step of your teaching journey. This is Teachers Talk Radio. Okay. Hello, Todd. Are you back? Yep. Sorry. There we go. Um, yeah. One thing that I'm, I'm just trying to queue up what we actually want to get through here. Um, I definitely want to hear if you've taught your first lesson and what that was like, um, because that's quite an interesting experience as well. The first one and the first few. Well, I'm really lucky just because um, here in Vietnam, I started teaching a few weeks ago. So um, I've already got two weeks and a bit under um, under my uh, under the clock. So um, yeah, I think the first lesson um, I think tells you a lot about the school and the type of students uh, because they also kind of set the norms for the school. Yeah. Um, my first lesson was absolutely fantastic because I got to know the kids. Um, <laughs> of course, I got to know the kids really well, and um, and it really it gave me a great kind of um, it gave me a great feel um, for a very different type of uh, experience. Just because um, it's an international school and it's incredibly diverse, I'm also teaching students um, who are more English language learners than I ever have before. And that experience, it was quite new to me. So having a good idea of how this teaching experience would be different. Um, I was given that in induction, I had a flavor for it, but it's only when you have students in front of you and you start looking at the disciplinary vocabulary that they are familiar with, that all of a sudden you realize, okay, well, here are the things that I'm gonna have to change about my teaching and the, the scaffolds that I'm gonna have to put in place that will be more useful. And I think every single school has a different context um, and a different flavor of student um, in terms of what those students are going to need in order to really flourish. So yeah, it, teaching my first lesson was a, a fantastic way to get to know the students and a great introduction to the school um, and, and a really positive experience. And I felt like the school really prepared me and set me up for success. Absolutely. I, I found the, a very similar experience, actually, just to pick up on the relationships with um, holding the line on, on things like uniform. Not that there's a particular issue in the context with the uniform, but on the small occasions when, um, you know, a student shirt comes untucked on the way back in for lunch. I found that's actually been a huge bonding experience and there's already a, a young chap who comes up to me every day now to, to check in that he looks as smart as he possibly can um, and uh, his expression is, do I look slick? <laughs> do I look, <laughs> what, what, do I look, um, uh, what was his phrase? Do I look professional? Do I look like a professional? And I just thought that would have never happened if I hadn't had in my induction, you know, this is this is our standard and this is what we try to maintain. And um and then of course, you know, a little bit of a little bit of me, but um it, it really, really fantastic 
kind of way to kind of get you up and running with relationships with students that you don't teach, which I think is just as important as the ones you do teach because we all make the noises of, you know, holistic education, school community, yada, yada, yada. But to actually live it and for it to be diastole and siastole is is very, very different. And um, yeah, something as small as that of like being in on those routines and being party to those conversations with students as well as in the lessons is is has been massive for me, definitely. Um, and in, interesting that you've said there about that new experience of um, teaching students who for whom English is their second language. So English language learners, so it's really fascinating. So they might have English as a second language or a third language, but these are students who wouldn't be on an EAL register because they speak so fluently, but it's because they've probably been able to mask because they're speaking English as another language so well um, that there can still be many misconceptions. So these are students that might fall through the crack. Um, so you might have students that are on a register that are getting specific support, but we have up to 40% of our students um, who are speaking another language um, or uh, this is their third language um, who might not have the same uh, understanding of a native English speaker, for instance. So it's really, really interesting to look at that nuance and what difference that makes in the classroom. Okay, interesting. So I suppose it's that classic thing of context being king, isn't it? And maybe that points to the fact that there are limitations to, you know, a single time period of induction. And I guess that sort of, um, what was the friend, phrase your friend used? about a um, culture? Acculturation, yeah, yeah. acculturation. So do you know what's really fascinating? Um, so the very first uh, extended induction session that we had was with our head of EAL. And he was absolutely fantastic. And the first thing that he did is he spoke to us for the first 20 minutes in Vietnamese. Um, and uh, he started off speaking in Afrikaans, but somebody in our the new staff in our induction group already spoke Afrikaans. So he just on a dime switched to Vietnamese and he gave a 20 minute lesson in Vietnamese um, about things that we should actually know. So what yesterday, today and tomorrow was, uh, types of transportation, so bikes, cars, taxi, and then grocery store, bank, school. <laughs> so that, wow. and he did that all while never once breaking into English. And it was amazing because he started asking us questions and he put me on the spot to the point where I was absolutely mortified and couldn't answer. I like, just hadn't been able to follow along. Um, but it really gave me a sense of like, I was nodding and smiling a lot. Um, I was pretending that I got it, uh, but I didn't. And you can really see what that must be like for students. When we went into the further into the induction, though, what I really liked and what was the acculturation aspect of, of his session was that he went through what the process was like when you admit students into a school. We looked at essays that students wrote. So we had an example of where they were starting out at. He did success stories and he did stories where things had gone wrong and these students weren't able to get the results because we weren't supporting them. So we looked at case studies. We also looked at things like emails that had been sent. So staff members sending each other emails about what they really liked about strategies they used in classes or emails that they had sent saying, oh, here's what we can work on with the EAL department to support students. And having those real examples of real staff emails said a lot about the level of expectation um, that the EAL department had for how staff dealt and related and made sure that they built those supports. And it was kind of really, really clear that the AAL department wasn't there for one-on-one -on -one support with identified students in a classroom. Their purpose was larger. They wanted to work with teachers to create scaffolds that could be used for everyone in the classroom and they would work and use their time to build those important lesson resources that a teacher might not have the time to, to do that. Um, and they might not have the expertise that a specific EAL teacher does. And that way they could be used for not only those targeted EAL students, but all of those English language learners who could benefit from it. And that was something very specific to the school, but also um, it, it, it ensured that teachers were fully invested in the specific context and the high level of teaching and learning 
um, that, that should be in the classrooms for our specific students. So everything about that session melded together to, to give us exactly what we needed um, from the parents, or sorry, from the student's point of view, the teacher's point of view, and the AAL department's point of view in order to really thrive and do our best by these kids. Sounds fantastic. It sounds very thorough in terms of giving you that sense of the actual, the context, um, and probably makes a lot more sense once you've then met the students, I'd, I'd imagine, as well. Yeah, I think I went home kind of buzzing after we had that session, and I literally reworked my year eight lesson for the next day, and then I had an EAL teacher who was in um, my year nine class the next day. And instead of letting her kind of like, we had talked about her working with certain students, but what ended up happening is we had a discussion about the lesson resources for the next lesson. And within an hour and a half over lunchtime, she had sent me a whole bunch of resources that she had specifically developed that looked at key terms and disciplinary language and geography that we would be studying in the, the, the next lesson. And the fact that she put those together, that's going to make such a huge difference and making sure that these kids have that support. Um, it was wonderful. So right away, I know that my lessons will be deeply impacted and improved because I had that really important induction session. And it's not like I haven't had EL sessions before, but it tended to be more operational. If you want to know about the EAL students, go to this file in Google Drive and you can see the profiles here. Look it up and you can read them. That to me isn't a great session that kind of sets a high standard for what we want in terms of teaching and learning and understanding the kids. Um, and that's all you really have time for, I think, during um, a really tight few days of induction when teachers are overwhelmed. I think that when you have kind of extended over time, when you give these teachers space and opportunity to explore um, each of these aspects of the school and this, the students kind of at the center of that, um, I think that you're going to have much better teachers who can deliver and have a better understanding of the school ethos as well. Yeah, definitely. And I think that's, uh, you know, the thing you've touched on there really is about that support around the teacher so that people can kind of get up to speed as quickly as possible um, and, and kind of, I guess, work in partnership with with both the students and, in your case, the the um, the ELL or EAL um, uh, strategists within the school. But I suppose that could be applied to to any unique context, particularly, couldn't it? I mean, I, this is extremely silly, but I remember the first teaching role I took in the south of England, being from the north of England. Just things that I didn't realise were. <laughs> Not not real words. Uh, things that I didn't realise were, yeah, just just little cultural understandings that I didn't have, and that's within the same country, um, but serving a, a different community. Um, so actually, getting up to speed in those ways, I think, could could really accelerate your progress within a school. And I suppose that should be the aim, really, of the whole process, shouldn't it? Yeah, I think. I think that it's, it is school specific. Um, when I taught in the UK and I was teaching at a school um, with a large Polish population and I did not know how to reach those kids, I would have hugely benefited from more um, like professional learning and development around EAL and specifically how to reach those kids who many of them it was their first time in the country and they were trying to immerse themselves in a language that was really new to them. And it was sink or swim uh, when you had these kids in classes of 26, 27, 29, 30. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, it, I think it, it's not just when you teach internationally, every single school is gonna have kind of its own little culture. And I think it's funny, like we haven't quite touched upon every single school being its own ecosystem, basically. Um, I think it is fascinating that in this stage and age, or sorry, this day and age, we still have so many schools that are hyper specific in the way that they operate. Um, I would have thought that we would be more in line because there are huge platforms in terms of MIS systems, in terms of digital environments and platforms that would make it easier to move into a new school. But in fact, sometimes all of these different apps, platforms, communication channels, 
can make it more confusing. I'm moving from um, Microsoft Teams school to a Google school. Um, I was previously at a Google school before that. I know that many teachers have experiences in platforms like Seesaw. Um, it, you can use different things in terms of communicating with parents. Um, I don't want to go into, into, into specific platforms, but um, I will say that it's, it's really, really tricky because a lot of getting to know a new school is getting to know a new digital ecosystem as well. Yeah, definitely. And, you know, I am would be generally speaking fairly reluctant on getting used to digital things if I think something could be done quicker without digital. Um, but it is, obviously, it's one of those things that you need to tackle really quickly within a school. Um, and, and it's not arbitrary because you want to be giving the students the same experience across the school. Um, and I wonder why why there are so many different preferences. And I wonder if this is perhaps a, more of an international thing, but those having those sessions, having those technological kind of uh, overview, and I don't mean to generalise, but particularly for teachers who are perhaps, um, you know, a little older, I'm not, no spring chicken myself, but, you know, the, the technology can be a, a real barrier to, to success. Um, and it's funny, I... I I don't know why I find this funny, but as you're talking, there a Google school and a Microsoft Teams school, but it is it is in within everything about the school, so it does feel as though the whole school is um, is that operating system, that that technological uh, aspect. Yeah, I think it is. I think we live in a modern day and age that that's how students and teachers work. Um, and I think you actually see it quite clearly. There are Apple distinguished schools and they look for um, teachers when they're recruiting who are Apple distinguished teachers. They wanna see that they have teach, uh, teachers that are already trained up and Google certified or have experience, specific experience with Teams. Um, so I don't think that it's unusual that a digital environment can often make or break those first few weeks at a school because if you don't have that training and understanding, then it can be a confusing way um, and a difficult hurdle when you are first starting out of school. So I feel really lucky that a lot of the, the platforms that um, I'm using at my current school I've used in the past. Um, but I do know also uh, that I have colleagues who are brand new to this digital ecosystem. And for them, the simplest thing um, ends up taking about four or five times longer because you don't know how to toggle the right thing or what menu item to go to. And so um, it can make it can make those first few weeks really, really hard. Um, again, I'm not sure what your experience is like at your school, but what was it like when you first arrived in terms of IT? Is there anything specific to IT or another kind of process that was a little bit difficult to get over? Well, probably like yourself now, I think this is this is very much an international conversation, I think. Um, but when I first came to the UAE, I'd never touched a MacBook. I'd seen them in other people's houses <laughs> um, and thought, wow, you've spent an awful lot of money on a piece of equipment. Um, so I remember really angrily, <laughs> and it was angrily, planning lessons on my laptop that I brought out with me, which was kind of Microsoft. Um, and just just being so frustrated that they'd given me this very expensive thing that didn't do anything I wanted it to when I had so much to do, uh, or at least I felt I did. Um, so that experience, I think, particularly for people making their first venture out from particularly UK schools, but I'm sure it's the same for, for, for Irish and American and South African and, and all across the world, actually. Um, international schools technologically are... Generally speaking, I think quite quite a few good steps away from the UK. Um, certainly, some of the schools I worked in. Obviously, this is going back a few years, so I certainly remember that frustration. And um, you know, if you are coming from a place where you've not used and integrated uh, things like Google Classroom and Microsoft Teams into what you do, and it maybe is just a dark memory of COVID times, um, you you can become very frustrated. Now, obviously, in current school, um, some of the platforms are, are, are the same as the ones I've used in previous schools. So that, that then becomes a little bit more, um, a little bit more of a, 
just a kind of a reintegration into your kind of what you do and how you operate. But yeah, I, I certainly remember that early frustration. And I don't know what else the school could have done. I think it was probably just me wanting to, to you know, get going at 100 miles an hour rather than accepting this is going to be a little bit of a process and I'm going to have to get used to this piece of equipment first before I get on with everything else. And then once I had got used to it, everything was quicker. So um, I, don't, I don't really know if there's anything particular that, that inductions or schools could do about that. It is just part of the process of, of learning a new environment, as you say, in, in the modern world when so much of what we do is, is linked so closely to our digital, um, our digital platforms. I think um, I have the advantage I'm married to a digital strategist. Um, so I, I tend to be kind of like agnostic when it comes to different digital platforms, because I'm like, oh, I want to I use different ones and you get familiar with them, I think, over time. Um, but yeah, I think sometimes at schools, uh, especially when you start, you need someone who is so enthusiastic that they can sell you on this new platform. And I think um, having somebody champion those new platforms are really key. Um, I was just thinking about what it's like to arrive at a school. And when you're starting out, you have induction, then you have inset. And I was thinking about kind of fitting in with school priorities, because one of the very first things that you do when you arrive at a school is you become familiar with this year. This is what us as a secondary school or a primary school or a whole school are going to be focusing on. Here are our four or five main priorities. And then you come into a department or a year group and you find out, OK, these are our department priorities. Um, these are things that we are going to be developing over the course of the year. And I think it, it says a lot about a school when you when you have those very clearly laid out um, right from the beginning. So it kind of it gives you that direction and sense of purpose that you know what you can contribute to this larger vision. And hopefully it isn't just something that um, you hear and take in, but it's something that um, you feel you can be a part of. Because I think it's easy to kind of hear the word school priorities, listen to five minutes of somebody talk over um, a PowerPoint slide and then think, well, this is not something that really involves me. But I think if you are at a really great school, those school priorities, those um, points for departmental development, um, they become a part of your own personal goals and you're given lots of support around it. You're giving professional targets, you're giving lots of professional development opportunities for you to grow in that direction. It should all align. Um, and I think that really does begin in those first few weeks of the school year. And it's not just for new staff, but existing staff, that they get that really great start, that jump off point. Um, how do you think that can be best done? How can leadership make sure that they sell staff and especially new staff on what those school priorities are? Well, can I take you back a step? Do you, do you think they should? I, I, I'm not kind of, I think I'm probably agnostic on this. I'm not sure if the first little phase isn't just find your feet. Um, and maybe that then becomes integrated into what you do. I don't know. As you were talking there, I've always worked in schools where, where that's the case, but given everything we've just said that you've got to get used to, would it, is there nothing to be said for just you settling? <laughs> you get used to this new, <laughs> this new scheme of work that you've never taught. Um, using a bus system that you've never used before, um, you know, a piece of soft software or hardware that you've never used before, and the fact that, um, you know, when you first met all the new teachers, I think I spoke a lot in the CAP podcast about keeping a version of yourself that's, you know, maybe like the, the diet version. <laughs> <that thing. laughs> but, you know, with all of that stuff going on, um, is there something to be said for just fixing you for your four walls first? and then being involved in those larger conversations. I think that that's like, there's like gotta be a happy medium. And I'm just thinking about how, like ex successful inductions and insets at the beginning of the year that I've had in the past have been really well balanced. 
So in the morning, you should be doing kind of interactive workshops, whole school events, um, some type of CPL, C CPD um, that is exciting and interactive, workshop based, where you get to talk to other teachers and you get to have those discussions about things like the, your, the direction of your department, what well-being looks like in your pastoral context. Um, what it looks like when you, in terms of teaching and learning priorities. And then in the afternoon, you have to settle in. There's something about you need uninterrupted time to set up your classroom. Because I think the very first school tour that I did at my new school, um, we all went around and what every single teacher wanted to know was, where is my classroom? There was a history teacher who literally jumped up and down and twirled when she saw her classroom and started to unload displays that she had brought all the way from the UK to Vietnam out of her backpack so she could start setting up her room. And I think that's what you wanna do. You wanna have time so that you know uh, where you can talk to other teachers, uh, where you can interact, where you get to understand the school um, and its priorities and its culture and what makes it excited and all of that. But at the same time, you need at the other end of the spectrum, quiet time to sort your thoughts out, get yourself um, kind of on board with the new schemes of work. Um, make sure that you have your books all set and ready to go, that your printing for the first week is all done and that you know how to use the photocopier. All of those things um, are, are all really, really important and you need time and space. So I think doing things in the morning during induction time is fantastic so that you can kind of get those meetings out of the way. But at the same time, you do need time to do the, the very basic setup um, and prime yourself for the gauntlet that is the first term that you are teaching in a new school. Yeah, and I, I think that's kind of where, where my priorities lie. This, the, I think the idea of getting you too involved in the school priorities too early, is, I don't know, it's sort of, you're in a swimming pool trying to do 10 metres and Katie Ledecky and Michael Phelps pop over and start talking to you about tumble turns. It's a bit, you know, oh, well, I'm kind of drowning a little bit. Would you... <laughs> <laughs> Will we worry about me being underwater doing flips later? Maybe I, I don't know. I just I, it is certainly nice to be involved in the conversation, but I think I, I wonder if um, for the first phase it, it, it's maybe better just to keep it really, really simple. And as you say, sort your room, sort your lessons. Okay, you know. Um, well, it's quite interesting as well when you're talking about how you'd, how you'd run an induction. It's very clear that if we ever ran a school, you'd be the favourite and I'd be the curmudgeon because I was thinking, yeah, but when are you going to read the staff handbook? Yeah, but when are you going to tell them the house style? When are you gonna... <laughs> <laughs> why, why haven't you covered the behaviour policy yet? Are you going to tell them how to manage a canteen? <laughs> Yours is all sort of like fun and engaging and I'm like, here's some information. <laughs> I think that's the thing. You can give people information ahead of time, which is great because you do need that information. It's so important. Um, but I think you make a really valid point. I remember coming from Canada to teach in the UK and I'd had this really deep conversation with my new head of department who I desperately wanted to impress, desperately wanted to impress. Um, and she was wonderful. And so she sent me off to go look at um, the GCSE scheme of work and she had printed it all off. And I spent 45 minutes trying to open your ridiculous binders. Do you know that binders, the big ones in the UK, are mm. completely different than the ones in Canada? There's only like two like huge holes. They snap in a weird way. It took me 45 minutes. And finally, I had to go with her in with just in shame and ask her how to open up a binder. And I consider myself a smart person, but the simple the simple thing of getting used to a new place, it, it, it can it can it can take away and add friction um, to what you want to be a very slick operation. Why don't we take a break right here and we'll just listen to the news um, and then we can start talking about professional targets and the more exciting things that come after that very first week of school. Sounds good. This show is brought to you in partnership with John Cat Educational, publishers of professional development books and resources that support great teaching and learning in schools around the world. Don't miss out. Level up your professional development today and visit johncatbookshop.com to explore the full range of titles. Use the code JCTTR2425 for 20% off your order. Happy reading. Get set for the year ahead with the Bloomsbury Education Back to School Sale. 
Save 30% on all Bloomsbury education books until 30th September. From the very best in research-led practice to trusted advice on inclusivity, behavior, and curriculum design, we've got something for everyone. Visit bloomsbury.com forward slash B2S sale to shop now and save 30%. Bloomsbury Education, books for every step of your teaching journey. This is Teachers Talk Radio, and this is Teachers Talk Radio News. Media outlets across England, Wales and Northern Ireland have covered GCSE and other Level 2 results in detail. Many stories highlighted the fact that Year 11 pupils receiving results this summer started Year 7 in September 2019 but were in lockdown before the first year of secondary school had ended, with the BBC describing the cohort as unique. Many stories focused on the GCSE pass rate, which has fallen for a third year running, back in line with 2019 levels. The drop was steepest in Northern Ireland, followed by Wales. In England, the plan was to bring grades back in line last year, but they remained a little higher. The regional divide continues to grow in England. London continues to be the highest performing region with 72.5% of entries marked at grade 4 or above, compared to the 63.1% in the West Midlands. The gap is up from 8.7 last year to 9.4 percentage points. It seems the pre-Covid North-South divide is continuing. Four out of five regions in the North and Midlands had a lower pass rate this year than in 2019 but in every region in the south it has risen. Many have commented that long-term disadvantages within some regions are to blame. MPs warned last year that it could take a decade for the gap between disadvantaged pupils and others to narrow to pre-pandemic levels. Resits are also set to rise for both English language and maths. This is because the pass rate is slightly worse but the 16-year-old population has grown since the pandemic, so more places on courses to resit will be needed. Colleges have previously said they had increased class sizes due to population growth and grade boundary changes, but will now need to prepare for even more. This has prompted some to question whether the compulsory resit approach is still appropriate. Full details of the results analysis can be found on the BBC, TES and other education news websites. In Australia, the right to disconnect is coming into force. It gives employees the power to not respond to out-of-hours contact from their employer without suffering consequences. This has prompted some to consider the impact this could have on schools. While some legitimate out-of-hours activities have to take place, residential trips, visits and sport, etc., teacher unions have argued that staff should not be permanently on call. They have particularly focused on parent and student contact with teachers, especially via email, and the expected response times, which should be in place in order to protect work-life balance. The news from Australia has prompted fresh debate on social media regarding workload for teachers in many countries, use of emails, and the recruitment and retention crisis in the UK. The Guardian focuses on the story of a group of trainee female doctors from Afghanistan who have travelled to Edinburgh to complete their medical degrees after the Taliban forced them to quit. The 19 women arrived in the UK last week after a three-year campaign by the parents of Linda Norgrove, the kidnapped Scottish charity worker who was killed during a rescue attempt by US Special Forces in 2010. A foundation set up by her parents worked with UK and Scottish officials to arrange safe passage and student visas. They have been given places at four medical schools after Scottish ministers changed the law to treat them as home students, eligible for free tuition. One of the women arriving said, our journey here will be long, eight or nine years. I think during this time, many alterations and changes will come to Afghanistan. I am hopeful the situation won't remain the same. Finally, a primary school in Orkney has welcomed a new, unusual intake of pupils. According to the story on the BBC News website, the new class is made up entirely of boys. The rare occurrence is a first for the P1 class teachers, but the situation doesn't seem to bother the boys themselves. 
with one of the 18 saying the class was good without girls. The school is making sure that the boys will still have the opportunity to interact with girls outside the classroom, but that the boys only class was really special and something they're going to remember forever. This has been your Teachers Talk Radio News with Joe Fox. Welcome back. Um, so we are continuing our discussions of what it's like as a new staff member uh, when you are joining a school. And I thought that we would just go into lesson drop-ins. Um, so at my new school, when we were going through our induction process, there was talk of lesson drop-ins. And my immediate thought was, oh, this must be about quality assurance. So making sure that as a new staff member, they are checking in on me to make sure that I am a good teacher and that I'm the teacher that they hired. Um, what I found though, was that it was the exact opposite. The lesson drop-ins were so that new staff could go and observe ex existing staff and get a feel for the great teachers that existed throughout the school. Um, this was really, really useful because the school, for instance, that I've just moved to is an IB school and I have never taught IB. So the idea that I go and get to drop in on IB lessons was particularly useful for me. Uh, so I love that this was the approach that the school took, um, that it was more of what can we give teachers to make them even better and get to know the school even more right from the get go. I was also thinking about another headmaster that I had at his school. And one of the things that he did that I absolutely loved was that after new staff members had settled in, he always made it a priority to set a one on one half hour meeting with new staff members and just ask them about how they were settling in, ask them about what they loved, about what they were teaching, ask them what their challenges were. And it was a really free flowing conversation. And he had this little red notebook where he would take notes on every single one of these meetings and he would follow up to make sure that these new staff members, if they had concerns that they were dealt with, um, if they had strengths that had gone unseen, how to let them shine. Uh, and I think that's, that's a really wonderful way um, for a new staff member to feel very seen and very heard, especially by leadership. In my new extended induction, uh, at the end of September, uh, the SLT are actually going to be meeting one on one with new staff members just to do that kind of check in. So I think it, it's really important that um, we see these people as individuals and don't just assume that they are going to fit in because they are they are surviving and they're coming in and teaching day to day. You want to make sure that you make a very obvious effort to check in with these staff members and making it formal and saying, oh, you can look forward to this. This is your time and space. Um, I think that, that that's incredibly important. But what have you found in terms of making sure that new staff members get that time and space from leadership? Yeah, I mean, exactly like you said, that, that feeling that um, people are listening and, and looking at what you might offer beyond, you know, interviews are so short, aren't they? And there's such a strange, um, they're almost a thing in, in and of themselves, discrete from the job. They bear some relation to the job, but not very much. Um, so, so actually just giving someone that time, I really like that idea of, uh, you know, the little red book of, of notes of, of concerns or possible opportunities that new members of staff have brought. I think that, that obviously offers, um, new staff the chance to feel that they're part of something. As you were speaking, I was thinking about, certainly I have not had my excitement deflated. And I think whenever you join a new school, you join with that real sense of excitement. Um, you join with that, wow, this is going to be brilliant. I can't believe I get to be part of this. Um, and it, it can for some people, um, particularly if, you know, they, there are some people who join a new school and they've had a few knocks. If something in that red book, that concern is not dealt with, that, that excitement can soon be deflated and they think, oh, another one, I've joined another one. Um, you know, I'm thinking about some colleagues in the past where I, I could watch it draining from them because... Um, you know, they, they weren't having things answered. Um, this is actually probably one of a few colleagues that I did my PGCE with. Um, they seem to bounce around a few schools and, and very quickly become deflated. So I really like that idea of the, of the red book and of being listened to. And I've, that's certainly been a key thing um, in my induction is that check-in and that, um, 
something even as simple as one of my one of the SLT popped over to me and said, "Do you think this is your spot then to work from? Are you happy as, as this is your little area to kind of um, work out of?" Um, which you know seems throwaway, but actually was I was thinking, you know, I've actually been really debating that whether this is a good spot or not. Um, so yeah, those check-ins are, are massive. I think they're really important. Yeah, I think there is something about the culture of a school that's set right away when you feel like SLT are very, very visible. Um, the other day I had my head of secondary walk into one of my lessons and you know when you're in the first week of school and the projector doesn't work for you, so you're teaching technology blind, but you've just written everything on great big whiteboards, the kids are active, um, you're having fun with them, which is the most important thing, and they are completely engaged. Um, and so it was lovely to know that he was interested enough to just stop by, pop his head in. It didn't feel like an observation. It didn't feel like I was being judged. It felt like he was interested in making sure that I felt like I was part of an environment where there was an open door culture. Um, and I think it does set the tone. I think tone setting is really important at the very, very beginning. Um, I was thinking about some of the other things that just, they, they gave me this kind of nudge that the school was doing a lot of things right. So the emphasis was put on the very beginning of the year on teaching and learning, um, the sense that our school has five different um, continuous professional learning routes. So one of the very first decisions that you make as a teacher is whether you want to go down one of these routes. So it could be that one of the routes is learning forums where you are discussing um, a certain topic. So we had learning forums on adaptive teaching, metacognition, modern masculinity in schools, um, really, really fascinating learning forums you can join. Or it could be that you wanna do action research or another route would be lesson study. So the fact that you're given time that's set aside every single week to focus on teaching and learning, and then you're given a choice to choose an avenue that you are particularly interested in, uh, right there, that set the tone for what teaching and learning means in the school. So for me, I immediately felt really empowered because I had all of this choice. And I also felt like this was a nod to what the school felt was really important in terms of developing their teachers and staff and giving them opportunity whenever possible to do so. Uh, so right away, I think there's a lot of great things that you can do to nudge teachers to what you think um, should be a priority in terms of their time, the structure of the school. Um, and, and again, I know that you were going to say we need teachers to just settle in. <laughs> but I'm a huge fan of immerse yourself and like take all the opportunities. I love hitting the ground running. It is overwhelming and you do tend to go fast and perhaps trip. But uh, yeah, I think there's an enthusiasm at the beginning of the year that you really want to, you want to capture that, dynam that dynamism, if you know what I mean. Yeah, definitely. And I, I wouldn't want to spoil that. It's just funny listening to how you would run an induction and thinking about the, the, the priorities I have, which is always like, I always just want to see somebody else in the school teach, someone else in the school interact with the kids. I want to sign a handbook, having read it all. <laughs> just really banal things. Um, whereas yours sounded very dynamic and exciting. But no, obviously, I think teachers, generally speaking, are very, very engaged people um, who have certain directions that they want to follow. And they've joined your school for a particular reason. Um, as I said before, I was looking at which school to join and, and this was um, a school that was on my radar and um, there's, there's certain things about it that have made me want to be part of it and if as as I do settle in if those things kind of you know um, if I'm allowed to to or encouraged to um, follow my interest follow my engagements and follow my curiosity within that setting that is definitely going to um doesn't seem possible right now but actually increase my engagement and my excitement about being part of the overall thing um and you know you've you've pointed there that there are a, to the fact that there are a, at your new school a few ways in which that's um shepherded because you don't want everyone going off doing such different things because they'll never it wouldn't be possible to bring all those threads back together but within you know a, a set of a set of priorities that that excitement, that initial excitement, can certainly be a real a, fu a real fuel to probably accelerate the whole school. Actually, not to put too make it sound too grand, but I'm thinking about football teams. Often, a new manager or a new player, or you know, someone that's come from a different 
type of club or a different country can engage an entire new uh, a new way of being in a football team. Um, and I guess that excitement it is it is like dynamite. It is like it needs capturing, doesn't it? And so that that is one avue to rather than just reading a handbook <laughs> it's one way of capturing yeah. that, that lightning if you like I think, I think that's exactly it and that lightning I think there's so much energy that you have at the beginning of the year and when you're at a new school you are so excited you've been anticipating it and you've chosen this school for a reason I think it's about sustaining it so again I think extended induction over a longer period of time to support staff is the way to go because you can't fit it all in but when it comes to crunch times like let's say the use of data and reporting um, every single school is really really kind of finicky and how they how they use data and how that can be impactful on interventions so when do we choose times to give staff support and how to analyze that data um, I think that there's just this assumption that Um, that you will kind of pick it up naturally. But I think that staff can really be given that extra support. Same with things like the norms of student leadership. It's really nice after the first week to perhaps have a mixer with student leadership during a lunchtime so that new staff members can really get to know and get a feel for students. Um, and I think th- if they're mixing with student leaders, right away they know who to go to if they have questions, they know who the prefix are, um, who are the role models in the school, what the students feel are incredibly important for teachers to address. Um, I think those are really, really great ways. Um, that you can kind of get um, a sustained uh, a sustained induction um, that makes sure that teachers don't burn out and are continuously learning something while they're while they're in that very first term, that second term, that first year of being in a school. because um, things are are always new because it's your first time doing it, your first set of reports, your first set of parent teacher conferences. So getting those little boosts beforehand and giving that extra information, it also cues those high expectations that you want to have for staff. Um, so yeah, yeah, I think I feel like I've gone through such a great experience this induction and I've had really different experiences, but equally enlightening experiences in the past. Yeah, and and we did uh, as part of the induction and meet a meet the parents or some new parents or some existing parents were invited into the school and and I found that really interesting as well because you're getting a sense then of look you know I've sent my child to your school this is what I believe um this is what I believe the school is is offering and what i why I've sent the child my son or daughter to the school um and and then you have that really clear insight into not only what you expect of yourself and what you expect of the pupils but also what the parents expect um and i i won't go into too many personal details just in case it, it would reveal um anybody but um one of the parents said to me you know we really this is this is an an expense for us um or, or words to that effect and i i thought you really believe in this you really believe that this is the absolute best for your child Um, because in the way she phrased it it was as though she was saying to me we're pushing ourselves to make sure that they are able to attend this school because obviously you know but maybe others don't that in the UAE there aren't any um, there aren't any free schools for for expats in particular there are there are different levels and different companies provide different levels of uh, school fees within packages um, but they had clearly, Uh, added a little extra in themselves because they believed in the school well I know now when I'm having interactions that I have to keep that in mind that that this is something that somebody is maybe giving up a little bit of extra time for or cutting back on a little something for to make sure that uh, their child is part of this thing that they really believe in um so that that felt like a real introduction to the culture and Where if I hadn't had that I maybe would have come at it with some you know some misconceptions possibly I think that's really interesting um, why don't we have a word from our sponsors and then why don't we end on looking at school vision because uh, I think that's a huge component of getting new teachers on board 
Okay, sounds this good. This show is brought to you in partnership with John Cat Educational, publishers of professional development books and resources that support great teaching and learning in schools around the world. Don't miss out. Level up your professional development today and visit johncatbookshop.com to explore the full range of titles. Use the code JCTTR2425 for 20% off your order. Happy reading. Get set for the year ahead with the Bloomsbury Education Back to School Sale. Save 30% on all Bloomsbury Education books until 30th September. From the very best in research-led practice to trusted advice on inclusivity, behaviour and curriculum design, we've got something for everyone. Visit bloomsbury.com forward slash B2S sale to shop now and save 30%. Bloomsbury Education, books for every step of your team. Thank you for the word from our sponsors. Um, so we're in our final stretch, Todd. And uh, yeah, I feel like vision is actually a really good place to kind of end on because I think vision is why we chose to move schools and go to a new school. Um, we had to get on board with a vision that we thought was really important in order to kind of move. I don't think that we leave schools unless we know that we're going to a school that we are really on board with and the way that that vision is kind of sold to us. I remember one of the schools that I started at um, having a word with the head and during the interview. And for him, he said the interview was so important because he wanted teachers to buy in to what he thought was the most important aspect of holistic education. And that he saw the interview as a chance to make sure that he was selling uh, teachers on this vision, that it was so important that they felt that this was something um, that was, um, I guess, an imperative of their own. And sustaining that into uh, an induction, into inset, making it a part of your practice, that vision becomes huge. And it's the ethos and fabric of the school that you live and breathe it every day. You were talking at the very, very beginning about um, a student and their uniform. And it seems so silly to say, okay, um, the interaction that I had with a student and their uniform um, is indicative about the vision of the school. But I think it really is the devil's in the details. Um, when you're involved in kind of the understanding of who you want these students to be, what you are preparing them for, all of those interactions are kind of deriving from that, the, the way that you approach pastoral things, the way that you are in the classroom, the way that you provide extracurricular activities, the way that you drive these students when they are making choices um, in options and then later in their university applications, all those things I think tie in with that vision. Um, so when you think about schools with great vision and your own experience about getting on board with the vision, uh, what immediately comes to mind? Yeah, I mean, I think it's it, you've you've hit the nail on the head there. It's that process of recruitment, isn't it? It's um, you're both selling a vision, um, a vision of for the teacher how you operate with how you operate and who you are and what you believe, um, and they're selling you a vision of what you're going to be part of. Um, and as long as everyone's honest, and I think that that's really productive. Um, I think you you touched on there the idea of, of the uniform, um, that small uniform thing. I think very clearly on, on interview, I, I basically made it clear that I, I buy the vision of the school. And then for me, it's really important to embody that in the same way that um, they are embodying what they said they were on interview. It's important to embody that right from the get-go um, so that everybody... It has that assurance of, as you touched on earlier, yep, this has been a a, um, a good choice for everyone and, and we nobody is... Because I think sometimes in interview people do say things they don't mean. Um, I think it's important from the get-go to kind of be, be showing, even if you're not up to full speed, what you what you are and that you are the embodiment of the, the vision you said you were and that you have... Um, select a good match. Remind me of what your question was, Morgan, because I got so excited about that idea about recruitment. <laughs> no, I think you've answered it perfectly. I was thinking what immediately comes to mind when you think about vision and getting on board with vision, because yeah, we go to a new school because we're sold on the vision. And I think that 
everything that that comes thereafter, you want to make sure that it's the same vision and that it's not convoluted, that it's repeated, that it bleeds into all these different aspects of teaching because teaching is so multifaceted. Um, but I think keeping that enthusiasm and making sure that that vision is consistent and has clarity across all these different staff members um, as they come every single year and you're using the very best of the expertise that you have in order to accomplish that vision. Um, I think that that's a difficult thing to do. And the way that we um, induct teachers, the way that we welcome them, the way that we use acculturation to get them into um, our our staff body um, and make sure that they they buy into like the ethos of the school, the culture of the school. Yeah, um, yeah it, it's, it's massive so that it's in everything. I, th I think it's yes, massive exactly. that it's in everything that you do because the the worst thing to be on either end of the bargain um, would be some sort of dodgy secondhand ca um, sales car uh, car salesman, you know. Uh, Oh yeah, well, yeah, sold as seen, I'm afraid. Sold as seen. You, you knew what you were getting yourself in for. You know, no, no, you said you were the thing. What, why aren't you being the thing over here? Um, now, neither of us have had that experience, which is, which is obviously fantastic. But I'm sure we have in the past or maybe no people who have. But from a school's point of view as well, I don't think that should be a threat. That should be, um, you know, the worst thing to be as a school would be the teenager that, tidies their bedroom by throwing things underneath the bed. <laughs> yeah, just don't look over there. We've, that's not part of the vision. <laughs> um, so your new staff actually is quite a, a litmus test of whether you are actually who you say you are. And if you're not, I think a good deal of ownership with that. Um, yeah, a, a very, very strong head teacher that, that both of us know um, is quite open about the fact that even though they they think they're very strong and the school's doing very well. Yep, there's lots to fix, lots we want to work on. Um, so I think that transparency and being open to people saying, now over there, does that that doesn't seem to fit with the vision that we discussed, that what, what's happening there. Um, that type of, I, I don't know if she'd mind me quoting, but I, I think um, Rafif on uh, LinkedIn said something the other day about a leader in her school talking about, radical transparency was that the phrase yeah radical transparency is fantastic i think they used it at amazon um i believe but the idea is is that or netflix was it the idea is is that you um have completely open communication um and that radical honesty that radical transparency means that you actually have better collaboration um it's more open all data is shared um it's it's, it's really transformative um, and it kind of pulls back the curtains, I think. Um, and it gives a lot of freedom. I was just thinking as you were talking that one of the ways that you know staff members are comfortable and settled in is the fact that they might go beyond asking questions to challenging things, to mm -hmm. saying, oh, is there an assumption made here? And they have the ability to speak out and mm -hmm. they feel confident enough that, um, that they can take that psychological risk um, so yeah, that's definitely, I, I think, really key. And I definitely recognise that. I had a conversation the other day where I, I I went away and obviously I'm feeling very confident in my choice. I'm, I'm thinking, yeah, I've absolutely picked the right school. But as you know, I have um, <laughs> something called foot in mouth um, uh, disease. It's where I put my foot in it. I'm fairly confident, uh, fairly often and frequently um, by just speaking honestly. And I really thought I'd done it. I thought, oh no, I've said a thing. Uh, I've really put my foot in it. And the, the the leader came back to me. The person, the person from the leadership, came back to me the next day and said, "It's a really good question. Actually, we've done something about that." And I, I, I thank you. And I just thought that's phenomenal. Um, that level of ownership and transparency. Um, and it wasn't anything major. It was just something that I thought was a little opportunity. Um, but actually it was about, the question I asked was much more about me trying to understand how things operate. Um, it wasn't a, an attempt in any way, shape or form, but by an insecure leader, it would have been interpreted in that way. Um, it would have been interpreted as, as a negative challenge. So I think that's, that's really important, particularly if you've said, um, if you've claimed to embody a particular vision, that, that then becomes extra, extra important. And I will publish beyond uh, just our group chats 
uh, that blog about about that type of challenging conversation because I know that you wanted to reference that at some point, but that having that type of conversation as well, and I wonder if that could be formalised. Have you noticed anything that you think is maybe not all it could be? Um, maybe after a few weeks, that that might be something that would, um, you know, make staff feel part of something, show the type of leadership within a school. Um, scary to do, though. I do think that's quite scary on both parties. No, I think that there's, I think when we talked about things like having SLT check-ins and one-on-one um, SLT check-ins, are, I think that those are incredibly important. I think more than anything else, if you are a professional and you're working extremely hard every single day in a new position um, that can be extremely demanding, there's something very powerful about being seen um, and validated. And I think the fact that that member of SLT, when you were a new member of staff and you had a very like um, interesting and valid question, that they came back to you and said, we followed up on that. Your concern matters. I'm recognizing you. I'm seeing you. That's extremely powerful because it makes you feel more invested in the team and it makes you feel like you are valued by the school. Um, I, I think that that's actually um, pretty telling in terms of how new staff are seen and utilized because the very keen <laughs> student that sits at the very front of the classroom in me, um, just, I, I want to make sure that I'm making a good impression. I want to make sure that I'm doing my very best and I want to make sure that I'm getting it right, which is one yeah. of those things that you, that just naturally happens. You want to make sure that you are doing a good job because you care enough, you bought into the vision, you're coming to this new school. You, you want to be, uh, you, you want to climb the mountain and give it, give it your all. Yeah, and that's where we cross over. My thing is much more like I would see an uh, an error on something I think I should get right, like attending a duty as like a loss. Um, so even though I'm not that keen notebook person, I'm not going to project that I actually am. I'm just pretending to be cool. It's a lifelong problem. <laughs> um, now, there's a really interesting question actually just popped in, which is about resources um, being supplied with materials, what to do if you've not been supplied with materials when you're starting a new school, um, and potentially what exactly uh, you would do about that. There's a second part to the question, but it's quite big, the second part. So let's let's start with that practical element. Um, I know what I'd suggest, Morgan. What, what do you think if you were kind of thrown into that situation where you've joined a school with potentially some promises, but even the resources aren't available? I think this is quite common. I think that every single school um, has issues with resourcing, that resources are always going to be finite and they, they have to be prioritized. And that can be really hard when you feel like what you really need in your classroom for the good of your students, uh, this is extremely necessary. Um, and I think the thing is, as a new teacher, sometimes the very first thing that you do is you go by yourself mm -hmm. and you don't use your voice in a way that will prioritize your needs. Um, I, I think we have to recognize that that budgets are simply that they are priorities. And it's a really, really big question. I think what you want to do is you don't want to depend on um, things like financial resources to get what you need, but you need to look at what your fellow teachers are doing to maximize and optimize what is already existing in the school. Because uh, that's what you need. You need strategies because strategies that other teachers are learning, the things that you're doing in your classroom, those are things that you can control. Things that you can't control are budgets that are far above your head and resources that you simply don't have access to. Um, so when that happens, look uh, not for a way over, but for a way around. That would be my advice when it comes to, okay, I need more resources. I can't get them what do I do? Look and get advice from those around you. Yeah, the obstacle is the way. You were almost Buddhist there for a while, uh, Morgan, perhaps um, perhaps a, a conversion in the near future. Now, I would agree, echo a lot of what you've said there. And I, I would also say that sometimes these things can be a fantastic opportunity. Um, you spoke earlier, Morgan, about the technology not working. In the UK, I used to have digital free lessons. I'd, I'd put that restriction on myself. Um, the funds might become available in the future, 
but in the meantime, the reason that we're so passionate that we'd spend our own money is because we love those children and we want them to do really well. So um, I, I would suggest that possibly it might it might provide you with an exciting opportunity um, if, if you just reconfigure um, that. But you're right, Morgan, as well. It's important to, to voice those concerns. Y you can do an awful lot with a whiteboard pen and a whiteboard, um, but you can't do everything. And if there's something that you feel that's really necessary, um, I think flagging that early in inductions is really important. And I saw a... a a cheesy but I thought apt quote which is uh, which was pertinent to this the other day which is that um, walking in the wrong door is not a big problem but staying in the wrong room is um, and so potentially after following a, a series of steps um, it might be the most appropriate to look to look elsewhere but it, this the commenter seems to be saying that it's almost a an area-wide problem which is which is disappointing um, yeah. The second question is big. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I was just going to say, the second question I think we should almost do an entire show about. But yeah, I think that um, when we take a look at using resources, um, I would say that there are so many ways that we can resource ourselves by or stretch ourselves by using what's actually beyond our school as well. It just occurred to me that there's all kinds of resources that you can get online, you can get on Edu Twitter, um, that you can find by reaching out to someone on LinkedIn. Teachers are extremely generous and they want to share and make each other's lives easier. Um, so I'd say that look for help in all the places um, where you think you can get it because there are thousands of teachers who are in your exact same shoes and by kind of crowdsourcing your expertise i think that's where you can make a real difference yeah. um i think we've come to the end of our show todd do you have any closing thoughts that you'd like to share um i suppose just that that simple thing of uh, i think it's really important in induction that there's that open dialogue and also that there's um the mutual transfer, the mutual sort of, um, yeah, that everybody is, is doing what they said and being what they said, and we're, or at least working towards it. Um, I do think that it's really important that everybody gets absolute clarity on the house style and the policies and all those basics. But I do, I like what you've said as well, because it has to be much more than that. Um, it has to be about sharing that spark that made you join the school, that, that filled you with that excitement to join the school and join that new community. Um, and, and that light not being dimmed in that first phase and ways in which finding that. We started with the practical elements, um, but at the end of the day, as we've ended with there about the resources, the resources and the, the practical information, they are really important. But if you have that within you, that vision, that clarity about your purpose, um, the resources will get out of the way. There will be other ways of, of, of dealing with those practical elements. So I think a really full, well-rounded induction is it's hard to do. And we're both very fortunate to have, to have made good selections, I think, um, in that regard. Yeah, I, I'm so happy that I am where I am. Um, I think you're happy too. And I think there's something, it's exciting to begin at a new school. Definitely. I think I would just end by saying, um, the extended induction, I think, has probably been a game changer for me. I think that having many different sessions over the first term where I can go in depth and learn about the different areas of the school from experts, that really has made a huge difference, I think, in making sure that I'm on board with how the school does things. And it doesn't just feel like a superficial covering of where to go or a dry reading of policy, but a very lived experience that's contextual and shows a lot of care. I'd also say that like the vision of the school, having that crystal clear, um, I've gone to two schools where they've actually put the vision on the lanyard. So you know your lanyard with your name tag that you carry with you everywhere? Um, yeah. I've seen a school that they believe in equity in so much of what they do and their vision of the school actually is about adaptive teaching. So they have 10 bullet points about adaptive teaching that they carry with them on their lanyard wherever they go. And another school, the vision was all about pastoral care um, and how that is at the heart of the school. And so those pastoral conversations, um, those, those pastoral hints and conversations, that was on the back of the lanyard that they carried with them everywhere. And I think 
that, that says a lot. I think that vision should be intrinsic. It's something that you're given as soon as you arrive at the school. And it's something that you want to literally sometimes carry around with you every mm -hmm. single day so that you feel like you are close to the beating heart um, of the school. So mm -hmm. I'm really glad that we've had these positive experiences. And I can't wait to see um, this year kind of evolve. I, I think it's going to be a really good one. Yeah, and you've definitely spoken and written before about the, the school motto, and I think actually that's on at most people's lanyards. So that, that's probably quite an easy change for, for leaders to do. They could pick that up on Monday with new staff, couldn't they? So um, just going back to that motto and saying, here's, here's who we are, here's what we say we do. Um, and I used to start all my department meetings with that, with, with the elements of the dip that I thought were important for that year. Um, because then it was clear that the rest of the meeting was all about that. And if it wasn't, then I could be called out on it. Um, so, yeah, vision, coming back to that continually. I think that's really, really vital. Morgan, a pleasure as always. Yeah, so lovely. Thank you so much, Todd. And thank you so much to our listeners. Thank you for everyone who texted in. Um, everyone have a really lovely weekend. It's been lovely being a part of your day. Goodbye. Thank you for listening. Bye. You've been listening to Teachers Talk Radio. Tune in live and listen back at ttradio.org. We look forward to hearing from you next time on Teachers Talk Radio.